Hello. This video is going to be about calculating permeability. So the first thing that I got written on the board here is Doss's law for single phase flow, the flow of a single fluid, say water through a sample of rock. So let's look at the equation first. Okay, this is Doss's law. Q is what's called the Darcy flux or Darcy velocity, but it is not, and I emphasize not, a velocity. We're going to talk about that later. Q is the volume of fluid, let's say water, flowing per unit area per unit time. Yes, it has the units of a velocity, meters per second, but it's actually a flux. It's a volume flowing. Then we have here, this is the driving force, and there are two things that drive fluid through a porous medium. The first here, P is pressure. This is a pressure gradient. Okay, so you can imagine a piece of rock. I've got a pump. I'm pushing the fluid through. And the flow rate is proportional to a pressure gradient, the gradient of this pressure. Okay, the second term is gravity. This is the density of the fluid. G is the coefficient of gravity along the flow direction. And we're going to do that next. Okay, so you know that fluid would want to flow on downhill under gravity. So there's an extra term. K here is a porous medium property, that's the permeability, that's the fundamental property that governs flow in a porous medium, and mu is the viscosity of the fluid. The first thing when we actually come to do calculations that sometimes cause confusions is these two minus signs that make people often a little bit nervous, okay? But they make perfect physical sense. Flow goes from high pressure to low pressure, doesn't it? It goes downhill. So dp dx as a number, if you actually find a number, that's going to be a negative number, okay? So, but the flow is positive. So there has to be a minus sign here to flip the sign. On the other hand, flow under gravity, if we're looking flow downwards and we're flowing downwards under gravity, then gravity is a positive contribution to flow. So just think about it physically. Okay, so those two minor signs cancel out, right? And it makes it positive. Now let's look at how we might measure permeability. So here, shaded in yellow, is, is a representation, say, of a, a, a rock sample like this. What you would do is you'd wrap it so that you could have no leaks around the sides. You'd have a pump that would push fluid through the rock. From the pump, you could measure the pressure at the inlet, P in. There'll be a lower pressure because we go from high to low pressure at the outlet. And if the water's just coming out, that would be atmospheric pressure. So that would be the outlet pressure. And from the pump, you could also measure the flow rate or you could collect the water and you could see how much water was flowing. Okay. So that's your experimental setup or your apparatus. And you'd use that to measure permeability. Okay, so the first thing we want to do in this equation is find, well, what's this GX? GX is the component of gravity, which acts vertically, along the flow direction. So just to make this a general case, we've got a rock that's tilted at an angle theta to the horizontal. Now, you probably know, well, the component is going to be either G cos theta or sine theta, isn't it? It always will be that, OK? And then just think intuitively, well, if it's horizontal theta zero, so it's probably sine theta because sine zero is zero, okay? Um, but let's just go through this, okay? So I do think with these sorts of calculations, do think a bit intuitively, but then check, right? Rather than just grasp at things randomly. Okay, so here, this is theta. G is vertical, this is a right angle. This component, GX, actually is the component of G where this is perpendicular to the flow direction. So this is a right angle. So if we go through this, this is 90 minus theta here. This angle is theta. In this triangle, this is G is the hypotenuse. GX is opposite theta. So sine theta is GX over G. GX is G sine theta. So that's, that's correct. So what I'm going to do is now write Darcy's law using the values here. OK, we have two pressures and a length L. OK, so the Q can be written as minus K over mu. The pressure gradient right, is P out minus P in 
over L because that's the final pressure minus the initial pressure divided by L. So this is P out minus P in over L because that's the distance. Okay. And then we've got this other term minus rho G sine theta. Okay. So that's how we might write it. But often what we measure here is not Q, we say measure a volume of fluid that's flowing. So we actually pump in a certain volume in a certain time, or we collect the water. So we normally, what we measure is a capital Q, okay? And capital Q is just the Darcy flux times area. So Q is a volume per unit time. Okay, so this is what we measure, and now we want to find K. But what we normally do is we look at this pressure term here, P out minus P in, it's sort of always negative because the outlet pressure must be normally lower than the inlet pressure. So it's normally P in minus P out. So how we normally think about this is we say there's a pressure drop, a change in pressure across the rock that we call delta P. Okay? And that delta P is a positive number. It has a positive value. But what it is, it's P in minus P out. So what that enables us to do is to switch the sign here and get rid of that negative sign there. So what we can normally write this as Q is capital Q over A. Then we switch this, so it's K over mu, delta P over L, and then that's plus rho G. Theta. Okay, so how we then calculate K, we want an equation for K because we'd measure Q, we measure the flow rate, A is the cross-sectional area, so in this case L would be the length of the piece of rock, A would be the cross-sectional area here, this area, okay. So this would be measured, this would be measured, the viscosity, we know the viscosity say of water, delta P is measured, L we know, rho we know, G we know, and sine theta we know because we've designed the experiment. So the unknown in this equation is K. So we can calculate K. So we can write it down what the equation for K will be. K will be calculated as mu Q over A, okay? And then we've got this term down here. So it's delta P over L plus rho G. So that's how we'd actually do a calculation of permeability. So that would be where we put in the numbers. Okay, and we can look at lots of examples about how we might go about that, but fundamentally, that's the equation that we use. Before we go any further, the way I've written it here, actually, in the end, all of these terms are positive numbers. Okay, they're all positive. But you do have to think physically about it. When we look at the flow here, right, this is the equation for flow, there are two components. There's a pressure gradient, pumping, and gravity. And in this example, we're flowing downhill. So the two terms add, because we're flowing, we've got a pump, right, we've got a pressure change, that's one component, and we're flowing downhill, and they add to the flow, don't they? They're gonna get more flow from both of them. But imagine a case instead where I was pumping uphill. So I had a higher pressure here than here, and the flow was going uphill. Now, if we're going flowing going uphill, gravity right, is resisting the flow. This term here would be negative. Now, don't overthink the signs. Oh, how can this be the, the case, right? We're going uphill, we're going against gravity. So gravity is reducing the flow. And the reason technically is that actually theta would be minus theta, GX actually would be negative. But just think about it intuitively. If we're going uphill, then that takes away from the flow. If we're going downhill, it adds to the flow. OK, just think about it intuitively like this. And so what you can do here is you can put in your know, example values. So 
Let's just give a quick example, right, just to show how you might do this. So let's imagine a case where the cross-sectional area, say here is four square centimeters. Okay, so imagine A is four centimeters squared, and then do this in strict SI, four times 10 to the minus four meters squared. Why 10 to the minus four? One centimeter is 10 to the minus two, squared 10 to the minus four, okay? Okay, imagine the viscosity, the viscosity of water is almost exactly 10 to the minus three, and again, strict, strict SI, 10 to the minus three Pascal seconds. Okay, imagine a flow rate, Q, just as an example, that's a cubic millimeter a second, right? Right, so that's quite slow, flow is slow. A millimeter is a thousandth of a meter, and it's cubed, so it's a thousandth, a millionth, a billionth. So that's 10 to the minus nine. You do get some small numbers here, meter cubed per second. Okay. Now let's think, imagine the length, say 10 centimeters, right? Let's just give an example. So L is 10 centimeters, that's 0.1 meter. Rho, the density of water is, about, is almost exactly thousand kilograms per meter. Let's say G sine theta. Say we've angled this, so G is around 10, 9.81, but we've angled it so the component, I'm just gonna put in a number, say five, right? I mean, obviously if you've got a real angle, we can calculate it, but I don't wanna make it too elaborate just for a simple illustrative example. So imagine this is five and this is an acceleration. So it's meters per second squared. Okay, if it were completely downhill, it would be 9.81 meters per second squared. And as I orient it from the vertical, it will be whatever it is, right? So just, just assume I put that in. Okay, we got delta P. Typical pressure drops when you're driving the flow are of order one atmosphere. So imagine we have a pressure drop here, say a tenth of an atmosphere, right? One atmosphere is 10 to the five pascals. So a typical, typical pressure drops you're getting to get a measurable sort of flow rate of uh, uh, tens, hundreds of kilopascals. So imagine in this case, the pressure drop here, delta P is 10 to the four pascals. Right. Okay, so those are, those are just the numbers. What I'm gonna do because we're running out of space is I'll get rid of the picture here and we'll just put in the numbers. So we can calculate K and it gives you some idea what sort of order of magnitude to expect. Okay, so K equals, right? Mu 10 to the minus three. Q was 10 to the minus nine. So you can see immediately, you know, we're gonna get some small numbers. Okay, A is four times 10 to the minus four. So we just gotta be just really careful with all these, uh, with all these numbers. Delta P 10 to the four, over 10 to the minus one, right? Point 0.1, 10 to the minus one. So that's gonna be 10 to the five plus rho G, G is five and times 10 to the three. Okay. So what we have here is 10 to the minus 12 over four times 10 to the minus four. And then here, this is 10 to the five plus five times 10 to the three. And what you notice here in this example, right, and this is quite common, this term due to gravity is actually quite small compared to the pump. So even if there's only a pressure difference of about a tenth of an atmosphere across a piece of rock like this, that actually dominates over gravity. The gravitational term is relatively small. It does add and it's going to lead to a slightly lower permeability because what it means is I've got, for a given flow, I've got this extra bit due to gravity that's needed to get the flow to be that value, which means it's a rather lower permeability than if I got the same flow, um, a horizontal flow. But just because this is an illustrative on the board example, while I'm sitting there with a calculator, I'm actually going to ignore this term. But in general, you can't, right? Because it's a number, you don't just throw things away randomly in engineering calculations, but it is a lot smaller than this. So for an illustrative one, this is almost 10 to the five times 10 to the minus 
4, so that's 10. So it's 10 to the minus 12 over 40. Okay. okay, so it's 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 15. So that's 2.5 times 10 to the minus 14 meters squared. So space. So let's write that again. So divided by 10 is 10 to the minus 13. So it's 10, 10 to the minus 14 because it's one quarter. So 2.5 times 10 to the minus 14 meters squared. And that's 25 millidoses. So this will give us a permeability of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 14. One doll C is approximately 10 to the minus 12 square meters. A thousandth of a doll C is a millidoll C, that's 10 to the minus 15, so this is 25 millidoll Cs. That would represent, not really this sandstone, this, this sandstone rock has a permeability of almost a doll C, right, so a lot higher. This would represent either a, a sandstone that's been well consolidated or maybe a carbonate sample, again, with relatively small pore spaces of around a few microns. But this is a perfectly good illustrative um, example. Okay. The final thing we're going to look at, okay, this shows you how to do calculate permeability, and we can then put that permeability in Darcy's law and calculate flow rates. That's the purpose of it. So we do an experiment to find permeability, and then in a field setting, say in a reservoir or an aquifer, we can then compute flow rates from Darcy's law using the permeability we've measured. Okay, and I'm not going to go through that because it's just the same equation sort of wound round again. What I'm instead going to look at is speeds. Here's the result, and now I'm going to explain it. If we have a single phase flowing through this rock, the Darcy velocity is Q, okay? But that's not the speed with which the water or a molecule of water or something flowing with the water would move. Why not? Well, think about it. Take this piece of rock and imagine, right, it's just a tube, an empty tube. And I inject through, say, a cross-sectional area, one square centimetre, one cubic centimetre each second. Well, you know there is that the water would move one centimetre each second, right? Right, one centimetre a second. That's the Darcy flux. But now let's imagine this is a rock with a permeability of, say, sorry, porosity of 50%. So 50% is solid, 50% is pore space. Now let's think about this. I inject a cubic centimetre. How far does the water move along the rock? Well, it doesn't move a cubic centimetre because a cubic centimetre of rock only contains half a cubic centimetre of void space. So it's actually going to have to move two centimetres, two cubic centimetres of rock is filled because half of it's solid. So to fill a cubic centimetre of void space, you need to fill more of the rock because some of it's solid. So if I inject at one centimetre a second, a Darcy flux of one centimetre a second, I actually move through the rock at two centimetres a second. Now, if the porosity is 25%, one quarter, then I'm gonna move four centimeters each second. So in general, without doing this rigorously mathematically, I think you can see on physical grounds that the velocity, the actual speed with which something flowing with the water, so something dissolved in the water that doesn't otherwise um, absorb or do anything else, or if you want to know the average progression of a water molecule, or you imagine we have dyed water, you know, how does that dyed water progress through the porous medium, through the rock or the soil, the speed with which it does it is the Darcy flux divided by the porosity, okay, divided by the porosity. So the real speed is not Q, don't think that, it's Q over phi, it's actually a higher velocity because it doesn't occupy all of the rock. It can only occupy the void space. And that, that should be sort of almost intuitive just considering conservation of volume. 
So I think I'll finish there. That gives you an illustration of how we measure permeability, how you can actually, you know, put the numbers in and make a calculation, and also what speed means. And you can then do lots of calculations. You can calculate the flux. If once you know the permeability, you can measure the Darcy flux from Darcy's law in different circumstances. You can find the speed, and then you can find the time taken to move a given distance. And that's hopefully relatively straightforward. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much.